Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we just thank you that you are holy, Lord God, that you came as that little baby in a manger, God, so that we could be drawn closer to the Lord, that our sins might be forgiven, that we might be brought back into harmony with you. And God, we're just grateful for that tonight. We invite your Holy Spirit to have his way in this place tonight. Teach us from your word. Let us leave refreshed. Let us leave changed because of what you would do by your Holy Spirit. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen.
tonight for this Christmas season, God, that every year at this time we can remember your redemption plan. Jesus, that you came, lived as a perfect example, showed us how we could live uh, as God wants us to. And you went to the cross, you suffered and died so that we could be washed and cleansed from our sins. God, may we would never forget that gift that we got at Christmas over 2,000 years ago. God, I pray that our hearts would be full of hope, our hearts would be full of joy, our hearts would be full of your peace in this Christmas season. Lord, we just give you this Bible study tonight. Let your Holy Spirit move among us, the Spirit of truth. Help us to see, God, your truth, to have a greater revelation, a greater understanding of just who you are, and what you have planned for us. We give you our hearts. We give you this Bible study tonight in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. James chapter 5, we're going to look at verse 13 to start out tonight. It says, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. And so we're going to look at this passage. Uh, many of you probably can quote some of these verses. But God's saying there's a remedy. Amen? There's a remedy for our sin-sick souls. God can forgive us because of what he did at Calvary. But there's also a remedy for sickness and disease. There's a remedy for uh, when we're not whole in mind or body or spirit. And God wants to tell us about that tonight and what we're going to look at in our packets, all right? So let's uh, pick up in the packets here, uh, uh, James chapter 5, verse 13. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. That should be our first response when we're facing affliction, when we're facing adversity in our lives, we don't run to Dr. Phil, we don't turn on Oprah or call 18 of our friends and get their advice. It says if you're afflicted, you should pray. And God wants to teach us about prayer and how it relates to divine healing. A lot of times people today are not receiving healing, not because God is not willing, but because they're not what? Pray. They're not asking God. And that's the method that God has chosen to bring about healing is oftentimes through prayer, asking Him for that wholeness, for that touch in our bodies. And so when we're afflicted, we need to pray. The heading refers to trouble of any kind. All right? Just how valuable is prayer? Ask yourself that tonight. Just how valuable is prayer to you, to your peace of mind, to your wholeness in body, and in spirit. Alright? The child of God should readily know and understand just how valuable and important that a proper prayer life actually is. If Jesus, who was the Son of God, right? The Word become flesh. If Jesus had to pray, how do we think we can eliminate this all-important principle and privilege? He came to do the will of the Father by the help of the Holy Spirit, but by example, he went off into a mountain to pray many, many times. We can read it in the Gospels. Power, virtue, uh, a healing uh, anointing had gone out from him, and it would make him weary, and he would have to go get refreshed as a man, as the Son of Man, in times of prayer. And if that's what would uh, happen in our Lord's life, then we ought to realize we're going to need to be people of prayer as well. All right? Prayer is the greatest privilege afforded the child of God. Without a proper prayer life, it is impossible for one to have a relationship with Christ. In fact, one of the great works carried out in our lives by the Holy Spirit is to help us to pray. Have you ever been in a situation where you just don't even know what to pray? Because it's so overwhelming, it's so much bigger than you, well, God says there's good news. He sends His Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit can pray with groanings which cannot be uttered, it says in Romans chapter 8. He can say things that we can't even communicate in our native language if we'll just pray in the Spirit. He helps us to pray. And yet so few Christians take advantage of this opportunity, tremendous opportunity. We need to look at prayer not as a chore, not as something burdensome, but as an opportunity, a privilege, an avenue where we can communicate with God and have our needs met. Amen? 
have healing take place. Afflictions should put us upon prayer, and prosperity should make us abound in praise. If we put that into practice, we'd have less pride. We'd have less arrogance dominating our lives. If when afflictions come, we started to pray, and when prosperity came, we always gave God the praise for His blessings, then we would keep things in the right perspective. Times of affliction should be praying times. Amen? It is necessary to exercise faith and hope under afflictions. And prayer is the appointed means both for obtaining and increasing these graces in us. If you want more faith and you want more hope, then when the affliction comes, when the trouble comes, when the adversity comes, don't raise your fist at God and say, why, why, why? But say, God, teach me. Lord, I'm crying out to you in prayer. I've got to have you. I need faith and hope. God says he'll answer us. He'll help us. Why? Satan fights the prayer life of a Christian as he fights nothing else. If he can defeat you on this front, talking about your prayer life, he can defeat you on every front. And conversely, if he cannot defeat you on this front, he can little defeat you on any other front. Believers ought to be praying people in these last days. We ought to be praying more and not less as Jesus' return gets closer to, to being a reality. All right, unbelief is the culprit in many hearts and lives. That's why a lot of people don't pray. They don't think it'll do any good. Well, they don't understand biblical prayer. They don't understand uh, prayer to be more than just a ritual or a ceremony. But prayer is, it's our, it's our lifeline to God, if you will. And if we understand it scripturally, uh, we won't let unbelief rob us of the blessings of prayer. Alright? Trying prayer is like trying the cross. Both statements are foolish. It's like saying, I've tried breathing. <laughs> right? You have to breathe. It's something that's necessary. And prayer is that necessary to a believer, to a Christian. It ought to be. The cross is that necessary. You can't be saved. You can't have the blessings and the benefits, the harmony with God without the cross. And prayer is just as important. So trying prayer is a foolish thing to say, even say. We are not speaking of such as a ritual or ceremony, but rather communication and fellowship with the Lord. All right? And healthy prayer is a two-way street, right? We be still sometimes, Psalm 62, 3, and we, let, we know that He is God. We let God speak. We let Him prompt our hearts with an answer to our heart's cry. We don't just bombard Him as a heavenly Santa Claus with all our petitions and never let Him speak. It's a two-way street if we're having a healthy prayer life. We make our petitions known, we praise Him, we worship Him, and then sometimes we just be still. Say, God, I need to hear Your voice. And as Elijah found out, it's not in the hurricane, it's not in the loud noise, it's not in a flash of lightning or the rumbling of thunder. Sometimes it's just a still, small voice that God speaks to us. And if we're listening in prayer, He'll speak to us, even today in 2019. Alright? Petitions and praises. We should take every single problem to the Lord, no matter how large or how small it might be. We should ardently seek His leading and guidance in all things. Too often we're exhausting everything we know to do and then turning to the Lord as a last result. We ought to be including the Lord in everything, every part of our life. He's not just a slice of the pie. He should be in every part of that pie of our life. Amen? Our family, our finances, our relationships, our ministry. We ought to be seeking ardently His leading and guidance in all things. Most of all, most of our praying should be taken up with praise to the Lord, especially considering His great goodness to us, which comes in an uninterrupted flow. God's good to us not because we're worthy, right? He's good to us because Jesus is worthy and we're placing our faith in Him. Amen? And that's why we have an uninterrupted flow of goodness is because God is not blessing you because of you. He's blessing you because of Jesus and your faith in His only Son. 
And we need to remember that. Keep our faith there. It comes uninterrupted. Our petitions should be small in number, while our praises should be many. And when He does answer, do we praise Him? When He does hear our hearts cry and bring relief, bring comfort, bring uh, an answer to those prayers, we ought to be quick to give Him praise. Amen? We ought to be quick to testify to others of what God has done. How so foolish to ignore this tremendous privilege and rather solicit the counsel of weak men. And unfortunately in the modern church, that's what most are doing, is they're looking to men, the counsel of men, instead of the one who is the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the counselor, our Prince of Peace that Isaiah talked about would come. We ought to be looking to Jesus in prayer instead of soliciting the counsel of weak men. All right? Prayer and the cross. Our prayer lives can be greatly enhanced if we have a proper understanding of the cross of Christ. God's not answering our prayers because we spent six hours praying for the same thing. And we got enough hours in that God finally says, okay, now I'm going to grant it to you. Before you only had an hour and a half, but now that you have six, I'm going to grant you your request. You've asked me enough times, so now I'm going to answer. That's not how God works, right? He answers our prayers because of our faith in Jesus. And sometimes He answers immediately, and sometimes He is doing a work of developing our faith and maturing us, and it may not be for months or years before we see an answer to that prayer. He wants to see if we'll persevere. He wants to see if we'll keep looking to Him and keep asking, keep knocking, keep seeking. And we need to learn the secret of prayer. And uh, we can learn that by looking to the cross and what Jesus did for us there. To have such an understanding helps us to comprehend the means by which the grace of God comes to us which all of us must have on a continued basis. If you go a day without the grace of God, you're in trouble. And the grace of God comes to us through our faith being properly placed in Jesus and Him crucified. And then God responds to a heart that's looking there. It is the cross that makes grace possible. Alright, the amazing grace that the hymn talks about is referring to Jesus' finished work, right? Right? And so that's what makes grace possible, is the cross. Without exception, every single prayer that's ever been uttered by a man to God, and every answer that God has ever given as it regards prayer, has always come through the means of the finished work of Christ. In fact, were it not for the cross, the Lord could not even look at us. Think about that. Because God, it says in His Word, cannot look upon sin. The only reason He can look upon us is because our sins are where? Under the blood, right? But Jesus threw them as far as the east is from the west. So when we're in Christ, God can look at us. And the good news is, not only does He look at us, but He helps us as He now presently can do. He can answer our prayers because of our faith in His redemption plan. Because we've surrendered all to Jesus. We've stopped trying to earn things in our own strength and by the work of our own hands, and we're truly trusting in His grace. We're truly trusting in the plan that He put into place before the foundation of the world, Jesus and the cross. And so we need to have a proper understanding of the cross if our prayer life and as a result our healing are going to be what it ought to be in our lives, all right? Why the cross? If we do not understand the cross as the means of by which God deals with man and man with God, then we will try to approach God on an entirely wrong basis. Most of the time, it's we think we can earn something. We think we can make it such that God owes us something. And that's one of the most foolish thoughts the modern church has today. Is that we can read enough chapters of our Bible to make God owe us something. That we can fast 40 days and make God owe us something because of our 40 days of fasting. That we can declare uh, 31 faith declarations and that would demonstrate our faith being so strong that God would owe us something. No, again, God doesn't bless you because of you. He blesses you because of Jesus and your faith in Him. And is reading your Bible important? Yes, 
as long as it's increasing your faith in Christ and Him crucified. Is fasting important? If you're doing it scripturally, yes, it is. And it will bring benefit to your life if you're using it as a tool to get you closer to Jesus and to give you a greater understanding of His finished work. And all these things, we can have uh, things that we can be quoting the Word of God and it can be beneficial to us, but if we think it's our speaking it, something inherent within us that makes God owe us something, we've got a misplaced faith. And so we better understand that. Uh, the only way we can approach God is through the blood of Jesus, through His finished work. The basis of good works, merit, religion, etc. It's what most of the church is using to approach God. And they're not getting close to God because He cannot accept that. Alright? Such an approach could never be accepted by the Lord. Without the cross, the door is irrevocably closed. At the cross, Jesus atoned for all sin, past, present, and future, at least for all those who will believe. John 3.16, most of us can quote that, tells us that. With all sin removed, this makes it possible for God to deal with the human race on an entirely different level. That's why we say the cross opens the door for everything, and without the cross, there is no open door, so to speak. So when we understand the cross, we're praying, we're asking God, we're seeking Him, what He purchased, He purchased my healing. He doesn't owe me healing because of my spiritual good works. He, he's going to give me healing because of His grace, because of His mercy, because that's what Jesus paid for with the stripes upon His back. Amen? And when we exhibit faith, that's what God responds to, His proper faith. And so we need to understand how closely together prayer and the cross really are if we're going to receive healing, all right? Is any merry, it says in James chapter 5, let him sing psalms. It refers to singing as a form of prayer and of worship. Sometimes we can be fellowshipping with God just turning on a praise and worship CD when we're driving down the road, right? And letting that presence of God fill that car. Feel that bedroom, feel that wherever we are, amen? And the pre presence of God can turn our perspective around. We may have been discouraged and down because of some circumstances, but as we begin to sing songs and spiritual songs to the Lord, the Holy Spirit can change our perspective and give us hope and faith and joy. And that's what he, he's saying we ought to do in James chapter 5. It's a, it's a form of prayer and of worship when we sing. The book of Psalms is the largest book in the Bible, and that's not without design. Consequently, we have the ideal combination of prayer and worship. When you read, read those 150 Psalms, you're seeing a psalm book that they used in Old Testament times to pray and to worship God. And we, we should be doing the same today using music, using praise and worship as a way to fellowship and communicate uh, our heart's cry to the Lord, all right? I think the Holy Spirit is telling us that if there would be more singing of psalms and spiritual songs, there would be less trouble. Sometimes we're sick, and what we need to do, even though we don't feel like it, is begin to praise the Lord, amen? Sing psalms and remind God that He's our healer. He hasn't forgotten. It's usually us that needs to be reminded. Amen? But when there, we begin to sing praise and worship to God, the enemy gets, uh, gets blown to pieces, doesn't he? He's thrown at his best that he can, trying to make us sick, and we begin to praise God anyway. And that's how a lot of times we can get free. We can get the healing and the wholeness that we've been seeking the Lord for. We can find relief for the trouble and the affliction that we're in, we begin to sing psalms and spiritual songs even in the midst of our battle. As much as Satan fights prayer, he as well opposes proper scriptural worship and praise. He wants to keep you busy so that you don't have time to pray. He wants to occupy your mind with everything else so that you don't praise and worship God as you should regularly. He wants to do that. He fights it. In the creation of music, one might say that the Lord designed it as a trinity of melody, rhythm, and harmony. 
Melody, rhythm, and harmony. The music that God created has all three of those elements. If any one of these three is perverted, it becomes impossible to worship. Alright? We can probably all think of a time when someone was doing their best to play the drums, but they weren't very good at playing the drums, and you couldn't clap, you couldn't worship God because the rhythm was off. And that's kind of a humorous example, but God designed music to have these three parts, and so if any one of these parts is messed up, perverted, and sometimes the enemy is intentionally trying to pervert those three things, then it's hard to worship God, because it's not what God intended music to be. All right? Contemporary music corrupts both the melody and the harmony. There's a lot of contemporary music. It's very difficult or impossible to harmonize to. And uh, we ought to realize there's something wrong. There's another spirit oftentimes behind that music other than the Holy Spirit. We should only want music that's going to help us to be in harmony with God and to uh, be able to uh, be in, in right fellowship with Him. All right? If Satan can, per can pervert the music of the church, he has destroyed the church. That's one of the great things that we can do when we come together as a body of Christ, is praise and worship the Lord together. Amen? Have His presence moving among us. And so, of course, Satan wants to pervert the music of the church. Regrettably, he has perverted the music of the modern church. A lot of the music in the modern church says, look at me, look at me, look at me. It's nothing more than entertainment and what the music ought to say, according to Scripture, is what? Look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. Look how holy He is. Look how worthy He is. Don't forget that it's all about Him and it's not about us. That's true praise and worship. Alright, James chapter 5, verse 14, the next verse. It says, Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Alright? giving us instruction. Is any sick among you? The question refers to physical illness of any nature. No, the Lord doesn't need help from anyone, but He does use doctors and nurses as He uses many things. We ought to be thankful for that. However God chooses to bring healing to us, we ought to thank Him. Amen? So often we just want an instantaneous healing, right? As soon as we speak the words, we want to feel a lightning bolt go through us. And we have a sudden change in our physical condition. But rarely does that happen, right? It doesn't always happen that way. But God brings healing in many other ways. He brings healing by having the elders of the church lay hands on us sometime. A brother or sister in Christ who's mature in their faith. Praying the prayer of faith when you're sick. And God uses that as an avenue for healing. So too often in the modern church... Uh, people are not coming to church when they're sick, staying at home, and they're not receiving the benefit of James 5.14, having their brothers and sisters in Christ lay hands on them in the name of the Lord, anointing them with oil, and seeing this as an avenue for healing. He uses doctors and nurses as well. Technology, we ought to thank God for that. Divine healing refers to being healed by the Lord as a result of believing prayer. We are a church... We are a body of believers who believes in divine healing. It didn't go out with the first century church. We believe that God still responds to a prayer for healing. Amen? We have testimonies in our church of people being healed of cancer. We have testimonies of people being healed of all kinds of sicknesses and diseases. We believe God still touches His people in that realm and illnesses in 2019. All we have to have is believing prayer. All right. To the degree that we misinterpret the Word of God in any respect, to that degree we will suffer some loss. All right. The Scripture tells us that the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. What the problem is, John 16, 13, what the problem is, is we've got the devil sitting on our shoulder lying to us, right? Telling us that we're just going to have to settle with that sickness, that problem in our bodies that struggle in our minds where we're not whole, where we're not where we should be in our spirits. Oh, well, we just have to settle. Nobody cares about that. You just need to keep that to yourself. And we need to be yielded to the spirit of truth so He can reveal truth to us. What does John chapter 8 say? You will know the truth and the truth will make you what? Free. 
And sometimes we need to be free in our minds of the lies that the enemy is trying to fill them with. Amen? And that's healing. We need to be free in our bodies of the sickness that Satan is bringing upon us. We need to understand what the Word of God says about that. Be fully yielded to God's Word, fully yielded to the Holy Spirit, so that we can be made free. The Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. What are you going to believe? Are you going to keep listening to the lies of the enemy that says you can't, you never will, there's no healing for you? Or are you going to listen to the truth of God's Word, let faith arise in your hearts, and trust the Holy Spirit to make that truth come alive? We have to make a choice, don't we? God wants to bring healing for those who will believe, all right? We are definitely required by the Lord to walk in all the light that we presently have. Each one of us is at a different place in our spiritual walk. So each one of us has a different amount of light, revelation, if you will, illumination into what God is showing us in the Word. But you're responsible for the light that God has given you. And if you let that light go out, you're going to be held accountable for it. Amen? You need to walk in all the light that God has given you. God doesn't hold you responsible for the light that Jimmy Swagger has. God doesn't hold you responsible for the light that Gabriel Swagger or Lori Larson or Bob Cornell or whatever other preacher that we respect and honor might have. He holds you responsible for the light he's given you. The revelation, the illumination he's given to you. And he uses these men and women of God to help us. But we need to walk in the light that we presently have. Every believer should study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. God, I want to know your word more so that I can receive healing, so that I can receive through prayer, God, the answers that you want to bring to my troubles, to my affliction, to my adversity. If we choose to stay in darkness, then God can't help us. But if we say, God, I want all the light that you want to bring in my life, and we pray and we seek Him in that way, I, God, I want to know the truth of your word. He's going to reveal it to us. Amen? And that's what we ought to be seeking Him for. All right? Sickness and faith. A certain woman's only son was sick. Look at second, or 1 Kings 17. 1 Kings 17. Verses 7 through 24. Let's look at that story real quick. It says this, And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up, because there had been no rain in the land. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongs to Zion, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain you. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called to her and said, this is Elijah, Fetch me, I pray you, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray you, a morsel of bread in your hand. Verse 12. And she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal and a barrel and a little oil and a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as you have said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after, after make you make for you and for your son. And thus, for thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day that the Lord send rain, sends rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. And it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. And his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with you, O thou man of God? Are you come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? And he said unto her, Give me your son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up into a loft where he abode, and laid him upon his own bed. And he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, have you also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourned by slaying her son? Verse 21, And he stretched himself upon the child three times, and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray you, let this child's soul come into him again. 
And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber into the house and delivered him unto his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. Verse 24, And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. A miracle. Amen? God answering and bringing healing. We can see a connection between sickness and faith. Many view sickness as punishment for sin. There is a basis in the Bible for that view, at least in some cases. Can all sickness be so directly linked with God's response to human behavior? Perhaps more significantly, can believers who walk closely with the Lord expect health and healing at all times? Those are questions that all of us have had in our minds, I'm sure, from time to time. The Hebrew words, the Old Testament vocabulary of sickness terms for disease, for ailments, and for weakness, or illness. The word is halah, which means to be weak or sick. The concept includes weakness caused by illness, and there's some references, and by wounds suffered in some way, 2 Chronicles 18. At times, the concept of weakness is extended as a metaphor of national weakness regarding the entirety of a nation, Hosea 5, verses 13 and 14. Sometimes God looks on a nation and He says the whole head is sick, the whole place is messed up. Isaiah talks about that. But weakness, a lot of times, in our spirit, in our mind, in our body, is referring to sickness and disease that God wants to heal and He wants to make whole. Sickness can also be a matter of the heart and portray mental and spiritual anguish. <coughs> Psalms and Proverbs and Song of Solomon, there's some references there that talk about that. The Hebrew word for health is rapah, and it means to heal or to make healthy. In contrast to weakness, God says what? There is strength. In contrast to debilitating illness, God's Word says there is health and there is wholeness if we'll just believe Him. Amen? If you look at the Old Testament, the covenant of healing, we can see some things. Look at Exodus chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15, verse 22. We can see that God had a covenant of healing with the children of Israel, way back in the Old Testament. Exodus 15 and verse uh, 22. It says, So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. All right, verse 25. And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. And when he had cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them. Verse 26, and said, If you will diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord your God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon you, which I have put upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who, what? Heals you. I am the Lord who who heals you. They had just witnessed the plagues upon Egypt. But God said, These are, this is not your destiny. You are my, my covenant people. And if you'll obey me and hearken unto my voice, he said, he made a covenant. I will heal you. None of these diseases will come upon you. And so we can see that covenant of healing in the Old Testament. All right? At this time, the great covenant of healing was given to Israel. Exodus chapter 15. A type of the cross, the tree, in verse uh, 25 of Exodus 15, was a type of the cross that would come in the future, which alone could and can make sweet the bitter waters of life. All that Jesus did for us at the cross, it was enough to fix the broken, messed up uh, things in our life. And so that tree represented the cross, who would make the sweet Make sweet the bitter waters of life. Israel did not do too very well in giving ear to God's commandments or keeping all his statutes. There definitely was some sickness in the 
camp in Israel, but the health of the Israelites was far ahead of the people of surrounding nations, the heathen, the pagans, and other countries. All right, so we can see some things about God's covenant of healing in the Old Testament. All right? The covenant of healing presently, we have the promise of even more under the new covenant than they had under the old. And the book of Hebrews talks about that better covenant that we have. It's based upon better promises because it's based upon who? Jesus and his own blood, not the blood of bulls and goats. And so our healing, uh, the promise of healing for us is so much stronger than even what they had under the Old Testament. Sickness and God. The Old Testament unquestionably relates sickness to God. All right? Look at Exodus 23, verse 25. Exodus 23, 25. And you shall serve the Lord your God, and he shall bless your bread and your water, and I will take sickness away from the midst of you. Again, a promise that God would bring healing even under the old covenant. Disobedience to God would be punished at times by sickness. If Israel refused to obey the law and to revere God, there was this dreadful warning. We can see it. Look at Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28, verses 60 and 61. Most people associate Deuteronomy 28 with all the blessings that it talks about, but God also talks about the curse of disobedience in that same chapter. Deuteronomy 28, verse 60, Moreover, he will bring upon you all the diseases of Egypt, which you were afraid of, and they shall cleave unto you. Also every sickness and every plague, which is not written in the book of this law, then will the Lord bring upon you until you be destroyed. And that's if you don't observe to do his commandments. If you don't hearken unto his voice, as much as there's a blessing when you do, there's a curse if we don't. And that's what he was telling the children of Israel. Solomon's prayer, the dedication of the temple, shows the same close relationship between God and illness. We won't read it in 2 Chronicles 6. We know 2 Chronicles 7, 14, right? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, God says, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and then I will what? heal their land. And that chapter right before that, Solomon is dedicating the temple and he says, God, would you please, if anybody ever looks from anywhere on this planet towards where this temple is, your house, where your spirit dwells, and they repent and they surrender their life to you, will you make them whole? Will you bring them healing? I'm paraphrasing it, but that's basically the prayer of Solomon. And God says he will. He sent down the glory, remember? The glory fell upon that temple and the dedication of it so strongly that what happened? The priests couldn't even stand to minister. They were probably the first example that doesn't use that term, but it was probably very similar to what we've seen when someone is slain in the spirit. The priests couldn't even stand. They, it's like they fainted in the presence of the power of God. And so God responded to Solomon's prayer regarding Sickness. However, even though sickness may strike the land or an individual as a direct act of God, it is not always so. Sickness is a reality that affects all of humanity, and we might quickly add that it is because of what? The fall, right? Because of sin, but not necessarily our sin, it may be a result of original sin. The fall of Adam and Eve made it to where we are all born with a sin nature. And because of that, we have many sicknesses and many diseases, but God is merciful, amen? When we put that sin under the blood, He can make us whole. He can bring us back into harmony. He can heal our minds. He can heal our spirits, and He can heal even our physical bodies if we'll believe Him. And so we can see some good things. We'll stop there.